Good afternoon or evening, folks. It is June the 7th. It's a go today. It was the day of a pretty monumental battle that's kind of set the tone for engagement over the next few days and indeed weeks between the Canadian forces landing on Juno and elements of the 12th SS and 21st Panzer. And this is part of our World War II TV attrition and beyond the beachhead week. So uh, we're covering several of these engagements because as much as we like talking about June 6th and D-Day itself, the real fighting in a sense begins the next day as the two armies jostle for position. So joining me, I'll get straight into it. We have Mark Milner, author, professor of history in New Brunswick, who wrote the incredible book, Stopping the Pandas, about this very engagement. Uh, was it seven years ago, I think, that book, 2014? Yes. And we have Mag on the ground. The ground. Uh, we're starting, in fact, at a Norwegian monument that is um, because there was an airfield there that the Norwegian squadron took off from, but we're going to be talking about it in terms of the start line for this operation. So... Um, we've got lots of PowerPoint images. We've got Mag on the ground. We've got Mark and his expert commentary. So we're essentially we're going to we're going to leap in and start talking about it. So, um, Mark, the um, June the sixth, um, the ninth brigade, which we're talking about today, they were the reserve brigade. So they've had about as normal a start to D Day without particularly you know any particular casualties in, in, in large numbers. But now they've got to push on. So what was the object or what? What was the feature of the Canadian beachhead and what was the consideration over the next few days? Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to everybody. You, you, you've probably all heard that the Canadians were the first to reach their D-Day objective, but they didn't reach it uh, completely um, until uh, sometime later. Uh, a portion of it, 7 Brigade, actually gets on their D-Day objective at Brettville Puto on the, 7, on the 7th of June. What we're going to track today is the attempt by the 9th Brigade, which, as you point out, is the Reserve Brigade, which comes ashore late morning on the 6th of June, to push through the 8th Brigade. <clears throat> so you can zoom in right there. The 8th Brigade stops on the high ground right where your cursor is around a, a place that Canadians know as Anne Gurney. I'm not quite sure what the proper French pronunciation is. And that's where they pause for the night. And so uh, 9th Brigade actually uh, lines up on the high ground at Anne Gurney uh, early in the morning. And the objective uh, here for both uh, stovepipes of the Canadian Axis and, uh, advance, and that's exactly what they are. You need to think of them in terms of stovepipes because there's no effective coordination between the two. That's not supposed to take place until the fortress position is taken. Um, Nine Brigade is supposed to go down what's now the D220 through uh, Villon, Les Buissons, Les Buissons, Buron, Alti, Francaville, and then take up a fortress position at Calpique. And across the Mew River on the other side, yep, Calpique Airfield, absolument. Uh, across the Mew River on the other side, 7 Brigade, <coughs> excuse me, is to take up a fortress position. And this, I was, I, when you sent me the map this morning, you know, remind ourselves this was a, a pre D Day uh, plan. This is May, they're planning this big idea of it's all about securing the N13 highway and the, and the, and the west of Con there. So this, well, is, this is on schedule. Well, yeah, it's on. It's on. It's it's coming up to being on schedule. the The plan was always, certainly from um, the fall of 1943, for the Canadians to come ashore on this crucial piece of ground. And their their primary task was not just to be the tissue between Caen and Bayeux. Their primary task was to kill the Panzer counterattack, which uh, everyone expected um, would come up on either side of the Mew River Valley. The expectation was that the Canadians and, and British, well, British in particular, would have captured Caen, and that would have meant that the only way to get to the beach with mechanized forces would have been to drive up the D-220, or on the other side of the Mule River uh, Valley to drive up through Bretville, up through Camille, and ultimately to Cousseau sur mer where the, the beach could be reached and then the invasion could be turned out. So... What's interesting about the Canadian battle and what historians, I argued in my book, had neglected for the first 25 years, partly because they were engaged in narrative and storytelling, was that the Canadian task was never simple. The Canadians' job was to stop the Panzer counterattack. And if you look at their op order, that's exactly what it says. It's not nuanced. It just says stop the counterattack. So what Nine Brigade is trying to do on the 7th of June is to get forward onto its defensive position and if we could just flip back to that fortress map, Paul, before we get this launched, if you look what's in behind uh, 7 Brigade and 9 Brigade, it's an enormous amount of firepower. 
the Canadians come to Normandy as the single largest Allied formation to land on D-Day. They've got twice as much field artillery as the average British um, uh, Commonwealth Division has. It's got a, a, a 79th Medium Regiment in support. It's got most of the anti-tank assets of 1st British Corps, plus its own anti-tank assets. So you can see the two gun areas, the one around Bray for 12th, 13th, and 6th RA, and then the one just to the west of Grouchy and Auti for three field regiments, one British, two Canadian, and the Medium Regiment. And then the anti-tank batteries and the... Um, 90 millimeter guns of the Royal Marine Assault Squadrons, the Canadians are just loaded for bear. They, they come expecting to have to stop the Panzer counterattack. And uh, <clears throat> the research reveals very clearly that Rommel, if he'd had his way, would have had four Panzer divisions echeloned west of Caen on either side of the Mule River Valley in May of 1944. So the mm. Germans are thinking the same way too. And we'll so, be talking about it during the show, Mark, but the, this story has been told so often from the German point of view, largely because of a series of photos the Germans took of themselves there, the yes. Kurt Meyer mythology. And we know we can't get through this story without mentioning Kurt Meyer and the Germans. They, have, they are essential to understand the story. But we are very much presenting this from the Canadian point of view, that the Canadians have this huge firepower there, and this is the beginning of an engagement. And you know, we'll get to winners and losers although that's very binary terms later on but i want to put it on mag's image there because mag show back towards if you can and just say just before you do that just say hello mag because people think you're wonderful what you did yesterday so just say hello and to the viewers hello everybody yeah you did such a good job yes so if you can swing Thank around you. and sh show us the uh the cooperative building which will give us an idea of the start line on that high ground mark just mentioned and then you can swing back and we can show towards san conte so there Essentially, Mag is now facing kind of north now. So that yes. you can, I, suppose, I think you can see there, viewers, there is that kind of ridge of high ground. Well, that's the one Mark just mentioned on the map there. So that's towards the beach. That's where the Canadian knife brigade are coming. And that road there that Mag is on is one of the ones, the arter arterial roads that lead inland. It's not actually the one that goes from Villa Buisson to Franqueville. We'll be there later when we go to stand two. But yeah, um, we're actually on the east side of. Uh of the Canadian advance, but it's, it's a pretty important side. More action takes place on this side of the nine brigade advance, <clears throat> excuse me, than initially on the other side between uh, Le Buisson and the Mew River Valley. Yeah. And if you can swing that round to face south again, Mag, and then I think in a minute we'll have you move off to stand two. So um, yeah. we want to talk about the German positions. We've just mentioned them, Mark, and I think, well, let's, let's talk about their dispositions as well. So we understand that the two sides on this, on this in effect playing field. Right. Well, on the morning of the 7th of June, the Germans had managed to cobble together a Kampf group that was holding the line between Cagon and Cam. And you can just see it there in the left map. Um, it consists of uh, a, a, at least one battalion of infantry, the 2nd Battalion of uh, 50, 155th Panzer Regiment, uh, artillery regiment is there. They've got a fair amount of guns. That, if you go down the list of stuff that they've got, the actual forces in position between the, what's left of about a third of 21st Panzer and uh, what's left of 716th Division, which has retreated from the beach, they actually have a very considerable amount of uh, forces in the Mew River Valley, across the plain, and over to Com and, and that road that we just looked at. So uh, there's a large number of 21st Panzer Division troops in the tree line that you can just see beyond this road at Galmanche. And, and further north, the Canadians reported that they saw tanks and half-tracks and lots of soldiers and trucks and armored vehicles. Uh, straight ahead over the crest of the hill, just to your right, is Buron, where they actually have a, an ersatz battalion of 716th Division dug in. And then if we, when we get a chance and we look, uh, when we get out past uh, Le Buisson and have a look to the right down in the Mule River Valley, there's a fair portion of 21st Panzer that's down in that valley with, uh, with um, armored personnel carriers, uh, uh, half-tracks, rockets, um, artillery. It, it's a really very powerful group that's already there. And then by about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, Kurt Meyer is fully in place with the 25th Panzer Grenadier Regiment and the 2nd SS Panzer Battalion of the 12th SS Panzer Regiment. 
So he's got his Mark IVs up, and the best figure I can come up with from looking at the sources is that he has about 45 or 50 Mark IV tanks in the area uh, around uh, saint germain le blanche herb to the west towards Cap Piquet and out to the right towards La Folie, uh, and three battalions of SS infantry. And uh, I, y we need to mention this sooner or later, but the uh, the companies of the 12th SS Infantry are over strength. They run to about 220 all personnel. Uh, there's about 190 odd men normally in the 12th SS Infantry companies, and they've taken their Pioneer Battalion and they've broken it up and spread it among their their companies. So uh, the the Novas or North Nova Scotia Highlanders are going to advance uh, with companies that are at assault strength, that is a landing strength of 119 men. And the companies of the 12th SS that they bump into number anywhere between 210 and 240 men. Which is so, significant. I'm going to have Mag move on to villain Les Buisson now, Mag. So that, yeah. thank you for that incredible shot now, Mag. We'll, um, we've got uh, seven, six stands to get to today. So we'll just point out the Norwegian monument. I said there was a, there was a Norwegian airfield there, and the, the Norwegian ambassador was here laying wreaths yesterday. But um, so that's why we got the Norwegian flying there. We're just using it because it just happens to be a nice kind of little bit of a high ground on a road intersection. We use that same point as our start line for our Operation Charmwood shows back last July. So there it is, the, referencing the fact that it was a Norwegian airport. But I think, yeah, well, thank you very much, Mag. Off you should go to villeneuve brisson Colin is driving. Colin Taylor, the poet, is driving today, another tour guide. So I'll put it back on the map again, and we'll carry on talking about this advanced south. So... I'm going to bring on another image now to show you where we're going. This is our arena today, folks. Okay, now get your bearings. North is bottom left. See the blue, the blue arrow there. But this is the this is where we're going to be. So Mag has just started here, just where the little blue dot is below the the, the compass. She's they're heading off to Villeneuve Brisson, so and then they're heading off to Buron, Oti, and then we're stopping here at Franqueville, which is just before the M13 highway, and that's Caen. That's the the beginning of Caen over there. And the Tew and Mew uh, River Valley that Mark was talking about is over here. And you've got these various villages that we just saw on the map. So that is our arena today. And, um, yeah, oh, so that, that's just so you know what we're looking at. Just just while we have that map up, um, if you follow the track from the, the Norwegian monument uh, straight west of the D220, that's the axis of B Company, right? B Company on the backs of B Squadron tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers. If you go to the right between villain les buissons and caron le vieux that's the axis of a company in the open ground much more open in 44 than it is now so there's a company of infantry and a, and a, a squadron of tanks and then coming right down the road that we can see in the photograph here uh, straight down towards bureau is uh, c company and uh, c squadron of the of the uh, sherbrooke fusiliers so it's an arrowhead kind of formation, uh, geared up to uh, to deal with whatever they bump into, I guess. One way yeah. putting. Now, while Mal Mag is driving, we're going to show you another bit of video footage here. This is footage I took two or three days ago from a different view that we can't get to today. Okay, so going back that same image, this is San Conte over here. So San Conte, uh, I, I was about here when I took that footage. It's showing this kind of area here, the area between Buron, OT, looking towards Grushi. We'll talk about this ground later on, but I'm showing it now because, well, it's just using up the time while they're driving. So that's the thing we're doing now, folks, is we're, we're combination of live footage and the pre-recorded. So this, there's been a couple of comments in the sidebar about how open the ground is. And, you know, to anyone out there who thinks that Normandy is all hedgerows, yes, there are some hedgerows in some places of Normandy, but a whole swathes of it are open land like this. And of course, in June 44, you would have had a mixture of crops, three foot of wheat or corn, whatever you want to call it. And this is similar to what we're looking at there. So as you can see, that's the cost of Buron there we're talking about. The road Rushi road. Really in the background good. there. And that's OT. It, Paul, it needs to be pointed out that you're looking at the Canadian advance from the German perspective. From the German perspective in this particular and, view, yeah. And you're looking at it actually from inside the boundary of 3rd British Division. So if all had gone well, um, British 9th Brigade would have been up at this spot about yeah. the time the Canadians are crossing that open ground. But they aren't. 
the German. No, and this is another story of another day, the night the, the British advanced, because my great uncle was in the second battalion, Rolls the rifle, so he had found himself rather stuck in Combon Plain that day, and uh, lots of lots of nasty problems over there. So the these stovepipe advances that we're talking about ended up being functioning independently, which wasn't ideal. So right. Mag is now at Hell's Corner, but before yeah, and we'll take explain the name of this in a minute. But what I'm just going to do in a minute is walk up the track first. We come back to the monument in a minute, Mag, and walk up the track. Although, well, hang on while you're there, Mag. No, it's all right. Go on up the go up the track. We'll come back to the monument. So the problem is, Mark just said it, is that these roads have there's more building, there's more construction. San Conte is a lot bigger now. OT is a lot bigger now. Buron is a lot bigger now. So it's quite kind of tricky to find the views okay so this is the same view we used last year for charmwood so this is going up i'll show you where she is on a on the diagram again so um there's villain le buisson and basically she's going up a track kind of up up here really so that we can again see the same ground now this is kind of going to give us the the Canadian view, because we're going to be looking kind of towards the south, towards Carpeque Airport. So I'll put it on Mag's image there, then I'll let Mark talk again. So um, the undulating high ground, it's not, when we say high ground, it's not high, high, it's just sort of undulating ridges. But there is the view across the battlefield. Yeah, if she could step a little further forward and then swing to the right. Yeah. Um, if you can go in that field, the little McMag, and then, yeah, there we go. Perfect. So we're just going clear beyond that hedge. That's what we really want to get to see. Yeah. As you can see from this image, and you can see it if if you track the camera as it, it drives along the main road out to the edge of that bit of forested area around the chateau, what lays beyond that military crest is all dead ground. So uh, just behind the military crest was a large anti-tank ditch that straddled the road and ran for several hundred yards on either side. Buron is just down out of sight uh, beyond this point, which is why ultimately when the vanguard gets driven back and the, the British are, um, are late coming up on the left and Khan doesn't fall, this is where the Canadians hold for basically a month. That's why it becomes known as Hell's Corner, because it, it just takes a lot of pounding. Um, when the vanguard uh, finally got its artillery support about 6 o'clock in the evening, 6 or 7 o'clock actually, uh, they counterattacked from that high ground just in front of you down into Buron and captured it again and drove the Germans out. But they couldn't hold it because it was dead ground overlooked from Saint Contest and, and uh, under observed fire from the Germans. So they had to back up just about where that dotted line is. Yeah. And Mag is just here, where my where my Mount Cursor is there. Mag is just about here, so facing down this way. Um, towards Galmange, towards Saint Conte, where that other footage I just played a minute. And this is the road, this is the advance we're going to be talking about and covering in a few minutes' time through, as Mark said, Buron, OT, all towards Carpeque Airport, all as part of a concerted effort south that is not always working quite as well. Um, we ought to mention at this point exactly what this, con this column consists of as well. Well, it, it's, it's fairly easy done. Um, C Company is up front, right on the main uh, D220. The road that Mag just drove up, and uh, it's riding on its uh, squadron carriers. Uh, B Company is to the left in the field that we've just looked at, and it's uh, moving forward with B Squadron. And they take a, quite a bit of fire, and we might want to talk about that because there's a little battle that takes place here just to the left, straight out that lane that Mag was just walking out. A Company and A Squadron are over to the right, closer to Cairon. And D Company and the C Squadron, Battalion Six Pounders, Support Company, and a whole bunch of carry, uh, others are, are bringing up the rear. So um, they leave the high ground around Angurney about uh, 7.45 in the morning. And they get to this spot where Meg is now with the camera by about 10 o'clock. They've had some action in the field to the, to the east. Uh, they've lost a Stuart tank. They've taken out a couple of anti-tank guns. Uh, and they've cleared Les Buissons for the first time at around 10 o'clock. And what they're about to discover is that clearing a town of Germans is like playing whack-a-mole because just because they're not in the street doesn't mean they aren't still there. So while B Squadron comes up on the eastern side, it starts, it starts to take some pretty heavy fire from uh, Galmanche. And um, what happens is that B Squadron turns in an attempt to engage the Germans 
who were actually on the British side of the of the front at that point, the British side of the of the field. And C Squadron does something which is fairly common in Italy, but not very common in Normandy. They actually come up along this road and they all swing to their left and deploy as a squadron and fire a squadron shoot at Galmanche and Cam to support B Squadron. And then B Squadron begins to advance towards Galmanche and is immediately shot up and loses about four tanks and beats a hasty retreat. And it's at that point at about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning that Charles Petch, who's commanding the, um, the, the vanguard, tries to get artillery support, and he's unable. And he tries quite intensely for about the next hour or so, right through to about 12 o'clock. And he cannot raise either 14th Field Regiment, which is ac actually uh, on its way to Angurney, or 19th Field Regiment, which is deployed in the area of, about where the Canadian Cemetery at Bene is. And so this is the start of uh, the Vanguard fighting for about seven, maybe eight hours without artillery support, which is not what the doctrine <laughs> by any means calls for. They do have a forward officer bombardment with them from the Royal Navy, who has a radio link, in theory, to both Belfast and Diadem. And that's their fallback. It's like having two medium regiments on call. But the FOB's radio fails to work. And what they discover later is that he's too far inland. They need radio links. And there's a huge amount of interference from uh, other radio nets. And um, Belfast and Diadem stay offline for the Canadians for the whole day. So uh, here you have a situation where the Canadians are moving into a, a cul-de-sac with Germans on all sides, huge numbers of German artillery pieces in place with no artillery support of their own. Mag is just going to show us the monument up close there because it's it, when I take tour groups there, as I'm sure other people watching take tour groups there, even if you haven't started talking, people notice the two dates. And as you said there, June the 7th or 7th of June, the first day they go through and 7th of July and Monday, the second day they go through. It's a bit more complicated than that. And there are the mortar fins. They've, they've used mortar fins from the battle in the monument there as a, as yeah. a sort of souvenir. And the, the manor house, the chateau behind is, you know, is, is, has a monument like to the Stormont Dundas and Glengarry Highlanders. And there's all sorts of, um, bullet holes and things in the village there but this is from that as mark said that month of fighting that that follows this engagement we're talking about there but that's a great image mag fantastic so yeah. that's hell corner and villain every song guys i'm gonna ask you to move on to be on now we've got a lot of stuff to get through brilliant stuff brilliant photography and mark will carry on as the advance because that it's where buron is where well you, we talked about those those smaller actions but buron is where it starts getting a bit more um a bit yeah. more significant and dicey so interesting uh, uh Paul, interesting little story about the 7th of June and the 7th of July. Um, uh, the guy who wrote the history of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders uh, had one son who was actually in the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, uh, who survived the 7th of June, um, Will Bird, but uh, was then killed later in the second assault in this area as a follow-up. Wow. Uh, his only son, and so Will Bird, who wrote the history of the North Novas, had a particular interest in this battle. Well, so we'll be driving, Mag will be filming out of Collins' windshield. And so we're, we're, we're taking this road, the road Mark talked about, towards Buron. And when we get to where the anti-tank ditch was, Colin, who knows where it is, who's driving, will slow her down a bit. Um, you can kind of just see where it was. And there's a couple of aerial photos that exist that show you the anti-tank ditch. We talked about this, in fact, in our Charmwood show. So go back and check those shows from last June, uh, July. Ben Main did the first one with um colin and the second one was well the second one was ben first one was colin that's right um and that's the you know this open ground there that we're talking about but when that when they get towards buron they'll show you where the anti-tank glitch is and then we'll be stopping inside buron itself and mark will continue the story great footage mag you can see why this was such a, a good killing ground if you stop at les Bouissons at hellfire corner you've got all of this open ground in front of you uh, and uh, you cannot be seen from the German position. So as a fallback position, it's the only one that really works. Petch was told there's an alternate objective southeast of Buron, which is actually on that map, the Vanguard alternate objective. Yeah. It, it doesn't exist. It's only on the 1 over 25,000 Canadian topo. Well, I should point out the purists out there, this photo I used on the right there is from July, but it is representative of a Canadian advance coming down this same road. So I threw it in there because there are... 
very few images from June the 7th. The Canadians take way more photos in July, as do the British. But for June, we do have more from the German side, which is part of the reason why the story is often told from that German point of view, because of the lack of photos. So to remind you folks, they're making their way down this road here, and they're going to stop in the village of Buron very shortly. So they're coming in, basically. Yeah, I got to tell you a story about Radley Walters, who was in the Sherbrooke yes, Fusiliers. Please. Um, his his tank uh, took a, a solid round through the front glacius plate on the right hand side, just in front of the gunner, at one point, and left a hole. The shell apparently went in and went straight out, either through the floor or someplace else. And um, the engineers wanted to patch it up, but for reasons which will be obvious when you get to the intersection down here, uh, Radley Walters refused to allow him to do that because his driver could nose into the intersection, lean forward, look out through the hole in the side of his tank and see if there's anybody down the road. Well, wow. Radley Walters fought in this battle. On the Canada yeah, and there's a, there's a Radley Walters Park just over to the right. Try to get my bearings. Hmm. And there's, a, and there's a stat there's a there's a monument to it and it's, there's a radley walters park or a little bit of grass area there which is good and this is the village of Buron. and if you if you're here folks and you and you you're exploring this area as ben main and paul reed will know and paul errington all watching this if you go off the road to the right you can stop at various buildings along there that have lots and lots of bullet holes on them probably more from the july fighting than the june but it's hard yes. to put a date on a bullet hole exactly and we're going to stop in Buron in the square really while Mark continues to tell the story, to show you the monuments, essentially, and Mark will tell more about the, the, the moving through the town, because it's a favor of the tour guide, this, because it's a nice single route to take. You've got plenty of monuments to see as you go along, and it's a sort of a dramatic story. Right. Well, while we're lining up for the monument, let me just um, observe that uh, the North Nova Scotia's recce squadron uh, probed uh, Buron about 10.30 in the morning. They engaged a couple of hornets, as they called it, shot up a couple of tanks and some anti-tank guns. And then uh, by about noon, 12 o'clock, uh, Buron was declared secure. Uh, again, another great mistake on the part of Petch and his, and his officers. Um, the headquarters arrives uh, around noon, presumably right about in the square where we're... Uh, where we are that's looking down the road towards Auti. in fact if you hold that shot there for a second mag i'll show you a then and now now this again is a july photo we're talking about here but it gives you an idea of where we are see the building in the background there folks if you go forward a bit mag you hold that exact angle there's that there's a photo of a sherman tank coming back around that corner so just to prove there we are so there's a there's the wartime photo and there's mag's shot so the same building there on the corner very cool brilliant and um and Matt, back to uh, back to the monuments and paul errington who's a ledger guide mark who takes some um, panzers tours through uh, normally a lot he's been watching this with notepad he's got a question for you yep. in your thoughts as to why the canadian recce's had not identified the hitler youth division occupying the line across the front of the canadian advance uh i don't think at this point and i stand to be corrected paul i don't think they've encountered any 12th ss this is all 21st Panzer and 716th Division up to this point, at least based on the documents that I've seen. Uh, there's lots of uh, 21st Panzer, about a third of 21st Panzer is actually in this area. If you want to track this really closely, the, um, the uh, testimony of Kurt Meyer's trial has been published by a guy named Chris Madsen. I don't remember the other author's name. Yeah. But yeah. it's chock-a-block full of 1945 testimony about who was where and who did what, and um, and where were you? And uh, much of what I get out of uh, and, and put in the book actually came out of that first-person testimony from 1945. Brilliant stuff. Um, amazing imagery, Mag. So that's the, that's the armored unit we're talking about, the Sherbet Fusiliers. They come yeah. up into a lot of stories because they get involved in totalized and tractable later on. Of course, they are they are you know one of those units that you come up again and again in the conversations about normally from a Canadian point of view. And this is the little square in Buron that has a, a monuments to High and Light Infantry. And there's the say Radley Walters Park is across the road and over the corner. And um, yeah, it's it's the, 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 and don't forget, folks, these events were happening 77 years ago today. That's why we brought you this show on this particular day because of the significance of the anniversary. Yeah, the HLI aren't there for another month, but uh, no, but they're but they're in the yeah they're in the yeah, square. They're in in turn with 
Um, so by noon, Petch has got three of his infantry companies in Bureau. Most of the tanks are up on the flanks in a kind of holding position. He's taken enormous firepower from uh, saint Contes and uh, Galmanche, and also from uh, Grouchy to the west. And that's when he, he strives really mightily to get his fob and to get his foos um, to, to bring down some firepower. And they can't. Uh, and so his plan then, by about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, while they're still playing whack-a-mole in Buron, trying to get the last German, who seems to constantly be hidden, these are not 12th SS. These are 21st Panzer. And the Canadians commented that 21st Panzer was quite prepared to fight to the finish. 716th, less enthusiastic, but 21st Panzer, when they get to go to Ati as well, 21st Panzer want to duke it out. They, they, they're pretty professional, pretty hardcore. And they're the guys wearing the camo smocks, which leads to confusion later um, during the trial because a lot of the questioning is, you know, did the guys who murdered your friends wear camouflage? Well, yes, camo smocks or camo uniforms. Oh, I can't remember, which is why Kurt Meyer gets tried only for the murders in the Abbey, not the murders in the field that take place on this day. Mm. So by about 1300, they sent a number of brand carriers down that road that Paul showed you where the tank was parked from the July, from the July battle and started to probe towards Auti to see how heavily it's defended. So there's an initial push from Buron down towards Auti, just to the east there of Grouchy. And what the Canadians discover when they do that is that the Germans are in Grouchy, and the Germans are in saint Contes and Cousy and Beto. And now they're driving down across a, an open stretch, which has urbanized a little bit and closed in now that it's got its traffic circle but quite a wide open stretch under observation, under observed fire. So getting from Buron to Auti during this uh, early afternoon of the 7th of June is kind of problematic and it only gets worse as the afternoon wears on. Oh, lost Max image temporarily there. Yep. She'll be back. This happens every now and then. Um, I also want to point out that we've got some great images courtesy of Frederick Jeanne, who wrote Hold the Oak Line and Three Days of Hell. The link is in the description below, as is the link, of course, to Mark's book. Um, and the Abbey Dardenne will feature in our story. And while Mag is drawn, oh, we've got Mag back now. I'll bring that in later on then. So Mag is now yeah. heading off towards um, Oti. And as Mark said, there all of these villages are bigger than they were then. There's expansion around the side of them. There's new roundabouts, traffic circles, um, housing areas, speed bumps, the curse of tour guides in Normandy. But as we push down the road now, folks, if you look over to, if Mag pans down to the left a bit, you should be able to see in the copse of trees over there is the Abbey Dardenne, which is where, as Mark said, we haven't got into the 12th SS yet, but that's where they are, or some of them are. Some the, of them are, yeah. the observers are, I should point out. Yeah. 12th SS at this point is actually in an arc. Yeah. From due south of the Canadian advance at Francaville, right around to uh, Cousy and up towards La Folie. Some of them are pointed at Le Com, towards your great uncle, I guess. Uh, yeah. Getting ready to attack. So this traffic circuit is about, about a year and a half, two years old. You may, whether you've been here last, Mark, it's probably coming oh, yeah, yeah. last year. It was there, certainly there two years ago, and I think a okay. year before. Uh, Grouchy to your right. So this great open plain, which is already beginning to get squeezed. Uh, gee, it's squeezed a lot in the last 30 years since I started doing this. Yeah. Um, had to be traversed. And the Germans have some of their PAC 43, 41, big anti, uh, 88 anti-tank guns uh, to the left at Grouchy and at Cousy. And uh, they're just sniping tanks and people coming across. Um once we get past this building here, there's a there's a tennis court and a hedged area. And that's where they're going to park, yeah. Okay, then we can talk about that. Oh, there's building work going on. So the area we, we identified on Google Earth, the park, seems to have been building on, but they can they can that's hop right. out and have a look at something. So, yeah, so I mean, while Mag is getting out, this is an image of the Abbey Dardenne from 1944, and these that, that's the well-published photo that's in all the books of observation from the tower at Abbey Dardenne. But these photos are uh, also from a period 
and that one. But look, this is this is one of Frederick Jan's photos from a couple of years ago when he he was lucky enough to get access to the tower in the Abbey Darden. And you can see the Germans looking through those holes there. Well, there's one of Frederick's shot through the uh, the same portal there. And these, you know, Frederick kindly let me use these for the show there. And you can see what an advantage that uh, they had. There's that view there, Mark, across. Yeah, so explain that, what we're looking at there. Well, what you're looking at is a little village of Kusi. And over to your left, just above that roof, keep moving your cursor further, 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 further. Right there, that's a little bit of Alti. Yeah. And then Buron just up at the back center. Yeah, there, there we are. So uh, they, they have oversight over the whole battlefield. And Meyer said after the war that the Canadians were advancing nose to tail like they were on some kind of exercise. And that's just not true. Um, they, so they, so what would you like, Mag, to film here? Well, th this area where the tennis courts are, I think that's where that is. Yeah. Um, two, comp uh, two platoons of A Company end up in this area uh, by late afternoon. So let's, let's just recapitulate. C Company, two platoons of C Company get across that stretch in carriers. And they the uh, D bus and work their way through one platoon on one side of the road, one platoon on the other side of the road, work their way through uh, through Alti. Uh, in some ways, like scaring rabbits out of a copse of trees. Seven Sixteenth uh, uh, soldiers are in here. They don't have much stomach for the fight. But B squadron goes left of the Sherbrooks, and A squadron goes to the right. And as the Germans scamper out of Alti, they're they're cut down by fire from the Canadian tanks. Uh, meanwhile, the Bren carriers from the uh, Canadian advance go all the way down to Francaville and hold up down there. So the Canadians, by about 1.30 in the afternoon, have taken Auti, have pushed through, and the two platoons have consolidated just about where Paul had his arrow right there. Come up a little bit. Yeah, there's a bit of a copse at the bottom end of Auti, and they consolidate at the bottom end of Auti. Then A Company comes in. Uh, and, and establishes itself in that little square triangle or rectangle of trees just to the northwest of Alti. They get in that area, and they put one platoon on the road to the right through to Kusi. And then the, the uh, while they're getting established and getting most of two companies into Alti, a tank battle erupts. It erupts in the area around the German gun position that you have on that map, and then it erupts uh, initially to the west, in the area just south of uh, Chateau Saint Louis, or Louette, um, where the Canadians actually bump into the first elements of 21st Panzer. It's the tanks they encounter of 21st Panzer before they encounter anything else. Yeah. And there's so, that view across that dead ground again there. So that's Bookie looking back. That right in the middle of the shot there, that's Saint Conte. There's a very, that distinctive, what I call the chocolate fountain, which is those of TV radio aerial mast there, right in the middle there. And you can see that open ground there. Fantastic they, work again, Mag. I hope they never take that down. It's a great marker. Yeah, that and the hospital in Corn. Without that, we'd be lost, li quite yeah. literally lost. So, so again, this is the area where they are looking across. They're just here north of OT, near the tennis courts, heading off towards, again, towards, um, well, we're going to stop in the middle of OT in a second. So, Mag, I think you can move on now to the town square in OT. So while Mag's moving, um, there's a two-hour tank battle that takes place according to Canadian accounts, from about uh, 1330 to about 1530 in the area to the southwest and southeast of um, of, of Oti, uh, the Sherbrooks engaged the Germans for about two hours. And the Germans have a great advantage in that they actually have anti-tank guns, but virtually none of the anti-tank guns assigned to the Vanguard uh, were able to get ashore on D-Day and only with effort were they able to get ashore in the morning of D plus one. So the Vanguard's not only advancing without artillery support, it doesn't have its anti-tank units up with it. So it's a kind of a one-sided fight for the Sherbrooks. Uh, they're trying to take out German tanks while they're being knocked out by 88s from 2,500 yards away. So um, it's uh, they, they give as good as they get, but they leave a lot of tanks and a lot of bodies on the battlefield. Absolutely. So we're just rolling into OT. I think OT, I don't need to keep saying it, but it's expanded considerably. But there's a little town square that they're going to be parking at. It gets very busy in the early afternoon because it's on the school run when you're doing a tour in the summer. When we had, when in the days when we had tours, you're stopping there and you're talking about these kind of horrific events of tank battles. And there's mums and dads picking up their kids from school. It's quite <laughs> surreal at times. 
So this is the square. This is um, the, the center of Otis. So I'll, I'll throw up the, um, the image again. So here. So there's the north again. The Abbey Darden over there. And they're parking the square here. So they're now actually not that far away from Carpeca Airport. The airport's the other side of the M13 highway. There's an industrial area today. And we're going to be stopping at Franckerville later. So this, we're, they're going to be stopping in the square here. And this um, th th this road that runs off goes up towards Kusi, which Mark has been mentioning, and the, the, the famous Abbey Darden off towards Caen. So they should, Max should be out now. So what do you want to mag to focus on first? The road, the road towards Kusi? Well, I, the, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what went on in uh, in Ati itself on the yep. day, because the, the memory of the locals is actually, uh, based on my experience, and I, I don't mean this disrespectfully, the, the two battles kind of get blended together. Right. Um, and when I asked them about that, oh, yes, uh, we remember the battle. And uh, they had photos and recollections from both uh, the, um, the 7th of June and the 7th of July. But on the 7th of June, it would appear that the North Novas came through here like a hot knife through butter. Um, the, uh, the, the, the accounts, the uh, first person accounts afterwards, when the Novas are driven back through here by the 12th SS, one of the things that they claim um, uh, enraged the 12th SS were the number of German dead and the German bodies lying in the street and lying everywhere. Uh, the North Novas were, like most assault units, very well trained, very efficient. We mm -hmm. talk about them being inexperienced. Uh, but these guys have been at this business of training for this kind of assault for a long, long time. And uh, 716th uh, was not a, 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 a frontline unit. And um, between the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, who uh, record several hundred Germans shot with their machine guns, and what the, the Novas did, Auti was a bit of a charnel house uh, by the time that the 12th SS comes back through here. Um, so this is uh, Place des Transat Canadiens, the place of 37 Canadians, and it's named in honor of the 37 Canadians who were summarily executed by the 12th SS in the aftermath of this battle. Uh, there are some really horrific stories uh, that take place right uh, in this area. Um, one of the worst uh, and most egregious uh, war crimes was the uh, um, the ambulance of 12th SS veering across the road to run down the column of Canadian POWs, which killed two men and, and in severely injured a, a number of others. But the most hideous crime, apart from uh, if you talk to the locals of Canadian POWs being summarily executed in people's kitchens and shot in doorways and uh, shot while they're laying on the ground and local people being shot when they go out to help Canadian wounded, uh, the 12th SS, um, right here at this square, pulled two bodies of Canadian dead across the road, just where that car is coming, yeah. along this stretch, and then drove their tanks over them. If, Mac, if you focus on the names of the French civilians at the bottom of the monument, because years ago when I was first guiding here, so I was, I'd be doing this tour almost once a week or once every couple of weeks, the bottom name there is Maurice Iver, I think it is, Mag, the bottom name. Maurice Iver, and yes. he was about 16 or 17 years. There were seven French civilians killed. And Maurice Iver's younger brother used to come out and talk to me in my groups. And he would say that his elder brother, who was 16, 17, was doing was what Mark just said. He was trying to pull Canadian either wounded or bodies off the road. And as he was doing that, the Germans, the SS, shot him for that. And the younger brother would tell me that he'd lived in that village all his life. His parents lived there. His grandparents lived there. And he said, I love my little village. I love my tobacco. I love my bakery. There's been a side conversation going on about how great the bakery is there. It's good. Said, on my bad days, he says, I see these streets running red with blood, is what he said. I, I, I visualize these gutters with, with red in it. And he would say that to my Canadian customers. And they would kind of as you can imagine, go ghostly white. He's passed away himself, the brother now, but that was um, that was my abiding memory of that story. Well, that's a that's a very moving story. Uh, I've heard a little bit, but uh, not as much contact with the locals as you have had. Anyway, so this, uh, um, by the time they get to the southern end of, of, of RT at about 1.30 in the afternoon, the vanguard stops. And if you believe the, the, those who uh, like to say nasty things about British Commonwealth units, it said they stopped for tea. Seems rather unlikely because a major tank battle had just broken out. And this is the point at which the, um, 
there it is, the sign for the 37 Canadians uh, known to have died in the in the in the in the village and in the area around it. A lot of them were shot in Buron as well. Uh, there's a major in in a company, a German-speaking uh, Nova Scotian major Rodenizer, who tried to stop it but um, didn't have very much luck. And it's quite likely that the uh, 12th SS were jumped up on uh, on uh, Benzedrine, as the whole yeah. German army was during this period. Anyway, but at 1.30, they consolidate in the southern part of the village. Two platoons of C Company, uh, a number of tanks, a couple of machine guns from the Cameron Highlanders of, of Ottawa. Uh, so they're, they're right down at the southern end of the village. Uh, a Company has come up behind them and occupied the northern end of, of Auti and put one platoon out on the road to Kusi to try to secure that. B Company has occupied the... Um, the southern end of Buron, where there was a forested area. And then D Company is actually holding on to uh, to Buron, focused for the most part uh, back to the north and to the uh, west towards Grouchy, because there's intense activity in the, in the valley of the Mew River. So um, Petch has been criticized for having his, his battalion strung out like a string of pearls. It's hard to know what, what else he could have done. But there is a two-hour tank battle that precedes the, the counterattack by the 12th SS. So they're dug in. They're, they're trying desperately to get artillery fire in support. And the irony of the stovepipe battles, Paul, I don't know whether you know this, unless I guess maybe you read the book. I have read the book. Yeah, but the 12th and 13th Field Regiment, RCA, were, including my father, who's in 13th Field, are just a few thousand yards away across the Mule River at Bray. And they are deployed and on their gun positions and ready to fire by 1400. But there's no capacity in the plan to coordinate fire from the two artillery groups, as they were called, until the fortress position has been secured. And so the Canadian commander, Royal Artillery, Brigadier Todd, uh, doesn't attempt to uh, provide Petch with an alternative. Uh, fire support from just across the Mew River, Patch has to continue to rely on his radio operators, who by this stage have retreated uh, through Buron and are back at the anti-tank ditch between Buron and Le Buisson because they don't know what to do. They can't get a hold of anybody, and they're trying desperately to contact the regiment. So um, th they're just about to take it from uh, from the SS, still without fire support. Wow, the mag is going to just show us the uh, the there's bullet holes above the uh, the door of the church there, um, and on way in fact all around that churchyard. So that's the yes. church in Oti, and um, you know I, the the discussions I had with the French from the village said it was just running. Well, in fact, the sidebar conversations it was kind of a frenzy there. These SS guys weren't even aiming at targets. It was it was almost um, just spraying anything up, down, left, right, and. I'm not going to repeat some of the horrible stories the French said about what happened there. And some of them you think maybe they've got exaggerated over the years. Sometimes some of them are probably true, but this is this is um some of the um the, the barbaric acts carried out by the, the 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 most formidable unit in that sense, in terms of their their fanaticism to, to die for the cause. And yes, yeah, so it's poignant walking around that church. And if it's too late, the church is closed for the day now, but inside the church is an exhibit about a Canadian artillery officer. Uh, who, who kind of hid in the confessional box there and took two bits of wood from that box as a souvenir back with him. And then his son returned them to the church 60 years later, but that, you know, you can't get in there at the moment, but this is amazing footage mag. And I think I'll have you walk back off to the, uh, the, the van and head off to our, to Francoville next. Cause we've got to do some, some really good footage from there, but this brilliant uh, mag is the mag. I always point out mag has the difficult job. I'm just sitting here talking about it. Mark's just sitting here talking about it. Mag is the one running around trying to keep the camera going, trying to keep the images going. So mag is the one who deserves all the plaudits for this because um, we, I boss her around a bit, um, but it's amazing to have this, this footage live. As I said, reminding you 77 years on to, to the day these events happened. Well, while she's repositioning, let's just uh, review what happens at the bottom end of the, the village, at the southern end of the village, where there are, are uh, yeah. two platoons of C Company. There's a monument to the, uh, the civilians, yeah. Civilians in the 6th and 7th of June. Um, they're, based, they're overwhelmed, uh, the ones that are deployed down there. They're, they're under a Captain Frazier, 
who's buried at Benny. Um, there's a couple of tanks. Uh, and they, they comment that when the SS start to attack, when they start sending infantry across that field that you can see, almost due north of, uh, well, due straight up from Auti in that picture that you've got, they come across that open field between the Abbey of Ardennes. There's a whole battalion of them that come out of the, the uh, dead ground around Carpiquet. And the Canadians described it as waves of Germans. And historians have been rather unkind in saying, well, these are just Canadians new to battle. It's all hyperbole. There couldn't possibly have been waves of Germans. Well, when you got 240 men in a company and you're attacking at battalion strength of about a thousand effectives, there's a lot of Germans in that field. And they, they uh, attack in a number of waves over the course of the afternoon. They push through Auti and then a second battalion starts to move about five o'clock and pushes in on Buron. While D Company, which is holding on at Buron, is, is stopping what could only be elements of 21st Panzer Division coming out of the Mew River, attacking from the west. So this the the, uh, the vanguard is attacked from three sides. Now, if, if the Canadians had access to the guns that they were supposed to have under the doctrine and, and tactical practices of the British Commonwealth, and if, if they had had two cruisers on the end of the radio, there should not have been a single German survive coming across that open field. Yeah. They had lots of time to bring fire down on them. But all they had were their small arms. Uh, the tank that was down there, I'm trying to remember the name of the officer, his 75 millimeter uh, didn't work. And it's only later they found out that if you put too much oil in the recoil buffer, it actually shorts out the electric firing mechanism. So they had to watch that. So they're, they're knocking the Germans down in windrows, but they can't stop them. And so the Germans overwhelm what's left of C Company at the bottom of the village. They come charging up this road through both sides. They bump into Rodenizer's two platoons of A Company in the northern part of the village and lay siege to them for most of two hours. They overrun the platoon that's on the road to Cousy, and then a second battalion comes up out of Cousy and begins to attack Buron late in the afternoon. So by about 5.30 in the afternoon, a flare goes up out of Auti that says the Germans have recaptured it. Just about the time, waves of 12th SS infantry, supported by tanks, are coming in on Buron from both sides. So by the time we get to the latter part of the afternoon, by the time we get to about 6 o'clock in the evening, what's left of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders is actually at the anti-tank ditch. Uh, D Company is there. There's a remnant of B. Nobody from A Company that I'm aware of. They've got the battalion anti-tank guns, and they've got about six Sherbrooke Fusilier tanks and two machine guns. And they've decided they're going to fight to the death at the anti-tank ditch because the SD and G, Stormont and Dundas and Glengarry Highlanders are behind them. But behind the, the Garys, uh, there's not much between them and the beach. So they actually elect to duke it out. And just as they are about to get overrun, a major from 14th Field comes up. I'll get his name in a minute. He deserves to be remembered. Uh, and Canadian artillery fire comes online and just saves them like a Hollywood moment in the nick of time. So here we are at Francaville, which is where the carriers got. Uh, by about noon, they got down this far as a recce and where some of the tanks got before they bumped into uh, 12th SS tanks uh, coming up out of the dead ground behind the traffic circle that you can see just up to your top right. Yeah. So just to just tell people where we are, just so you're all familiar with what we're doing. So the area we'd like to be is down here near the traffic circle. There just are no good views. Me and Colin did a recce last week. We tried various paths and things and views and embankments, just couldn't get a good view. So Mag and Colin apart here. And they're walking up this track here, which gives a view towards the Abbey, towards Cousy, towards Oti. And you can see from when they're, when they're there in a minute, you'll see the best you can, the view across towards Carpique Airport, okay, um, which is still a functioning airport. Where, when I can travel to England, I fly from Carpique back to South End. So I take off from a pre-war French airfield taken by the Luftwaffe, taken by the Canadians, and arrive in South End, an original British First World War aircraft airfield used by the Americans in World War II and the British. So I, I feel it's a kind of a history route. Um, mm. So this is, this is Mag walking up that track now. So again, thank you, Mag. Thank you, Colin, for driving. 
And um, this is so this is looking towards Gabby Darden. There's Colin there having a cigarette. <laughs> Naughty Colin, he's get, get I cancer. Hope, I hope it's a Galois. No, he, he smokes Marlboros, does Colin. So if, if when when there's a kind of a little bit further up, we get towards that tree line, and so Mag is working, they're getting her steps in for the day. Mag will kind of just basically do a 360 degree pan around, and we can see this incredible battlefield. And remember, folks, it would have been pretty much like this 77 years ago today. And yeah, and you just heard Mark said say this was so six o'clock six o'clock in the evening. So this is almost real time now. We're getting to the point where this was pretty much happening 77 hour, uh, years ago to the hour and there beyond you can see in the distance there there's the the hospital in Caen, the shoe that the all tour guides use as a reference and mag if you pan left and right while you're walking whichever way you want to go first it's your choice so that's back towards that's back towards ot and then beyond ot buron and then that dead ground over the left is the between the two and the mew that mark has been talking about and if you swing right the way around towards carpet game mag It's the other side of that ridge, essentially. You can't see it. There's, there's virtually an escarpment there. Yeah, exactly. And the 12th SS is deployed in all that dead ground, including about a third of their artillery, because uh, they got a, they, they brought their heavy battery up. So they've got an. I counted the guns. There's about 70 or 80 German field artillery pieces that are bearing on this field on the day. Uh, the ground that's just, uh, just to your front left. Is actually, I think, what's left. Uh, swing around to the left, Mag, a little bit. Yeah, that copse of trees. There was an uh, an anti-aircraft battery in the middle of that field with a group of 88s, which was involved in the battle as well. So there's just enormous amount of firepower slamming these Canadians. And, and Paul's going to point out to you where the tanks are in that photograph of Francoville. Um, yeah, so Mag is walking up here. The copse is just annoyingly off the edge of the photo there. But, uh, so that's the same photo on the left as the right, but the, the right is the blow up that I did there because you can see there, I've circled them. That's a that's a tank, that's a tank, and that's a tank. So who do we think they are, Mark? Oh, those are Sherbrooke Fusiliers, probably B Squadron, uh, bomber Bateman's tanks, probably one of them. If you if you get the German footage, um, uh, the original Pace footage, there's a scene of one of the tanks that's been stripped of its jerry cans and laying in front, they've actually laid it out. There's a sweatshirt that says it has a rhomboid tank in the front and it has Royal Canadian Armored Corps yeah. uh, stenciled on the front of the sweatshirt. So there's no question they're, they're Canadian tanks. Yeah, you can find that footage, fo folks, on YouTube. I can't use it because it's, it's one of those ones that isn't actually copyright free, but there are people who put it on YouTube kind of naughtily. So you can find it there. All these images come from that footage of burning Shermans in the SS in their spotty Poppy. camo there. Poppy. It's um, it's you can easily see Mag the Mag's her customary shot of poppies that she always does because that's Mag's that's Mag's signature shot. Like Spielberg has the the pan back of the camera. Mag has her poppy shot, which is which is which is wonderful. Listen, two things. Um, the the uh, the major that saves the North Novas. There's some of that footage. You yeah. can actually buy uh, the use of it. It was a major A W Duguid or, or Duguid. 34th battery of the 14th field who actually came up saw what the problem was managed to coordinate the fire and save the north novas from being basically destroyed good picture of a canadian tank the uh a comment i wanted to make about uh you know why we're always relying on good nazi propaganda footage um the canadians uh had a limited number of photographers and media people they were allowed to put ashore on d-day just like everybody else and um the the canadians uh, did what Canadians are wont to do, which is to say, who's got the biggest paper, who's got the biggest media coverage. So the Queen's Own, um, the Regina Rifles, the Winnipegs, uh, anybody who was in the large urban center had a cameraman and a reporter with them. If you're from a small rural area like Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or the Stormont and Dundas and Glengarry Highlanders from rural Ontario, good luck. The only people taking pictures of you on D-Day are the Germans. Mm. So we have no photographic record of this because there was no photographer assigned. Yeah, I mean, when 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 Mag, because Mag has to eventually stop in about ten minutes to get back in time for curfew that starts at uh, at, at nine p.m. our time. So we've got about ten minutes more of Mag, and then Mark and I can carry on our conclusions. But the we said it at the beginning the um 
the narrative has been told of this story so so often from the German point of view, part, partly because of this famous footage that I said that you can look for on, yes. it, on YouTube and the, 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 the Kurt Meyer mythology and all that stuff there. I want to just show you the clip while, we're, while Mag is walking up there as well that I took of I clam up an embankment near the roundabout. It's too difficult for Mag to get to. But this is the view from that escarpment, Mark said, point, pointed out. And you can see the N13 highway and beyond that. So this is, the, again, footage I took a few days ago. So there, Karbik Airport is beyond that industrial area there. And then I'll pat in a second, I pan the camera around again. And you'll see back towards. So we're now facing towards where Mag is. But Mag is the other side of that ridge. Or then, but yeah, with all the, the, the traffic circle around about its difficulty. But the airport, the runway still kind of runs across the front over there. But it is from the Canadian point of view, or from the Francoville point of view, it, it's again in dead ground. Yeah. You don't get to see what's going on in Carpique until you're virtually on top of it. Yeah. And the irony part, of course, we'll, we'll do this in our conclusion, folks, is that had the, this 9th Brigade advance got to the Carpique to create this, this, this fortress position, they wouldn't have found anything like as many Germans there then as they did when they finally got to it a month later. And we have a another big campaign that we will talk about at a future date. It's that what if we don't like doing the counterfactuals, but they the furthest Stuart tanks and advances the Serbet Fusiliers got to within what about a mile of Carpeke, Mark? Yeah, they got to the edge of the escarpment here, just just below Francoville. Um, I did a book on Carpique, by the way, at some point. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's, a, it's a, another cracking one. So yeah, you can see there, folks. So this is so Mag. Remind you, is Mag is in this uh, this trend. Alex Alex Black does make the point out that they've had their flanks somewhat exposed in the air yes. if they had got to Carpique. So to get to Carpique would only have worked had the British advance also worked and the other Canadian advances. This solo advance on its own would have it would have come to nothing. But yeah, had a few things gone differently. Uh, maybe maybe things would have gone, uh, the battle of Normandy would have taken a different shape. But I'll put it back on Mag's footage there because it's just truly amazing. So that's back to Francoville again there now. Yeah, if had they gotten to, to Carpique, it's every every possibility that they would have been cut off and destroyed. I, I, I can't see a, another scenario. Um, the, the best thing they could have done was to pull back to that position at Hell's Corner. Yeah, eminently defensible. And incidentally, we saw wheat fields. Wheat fields now are quite short. The, the new genetically modified wheat's only about 18 inches, maybe two inches high. But in, in the summer of 1944, that wheat would have been three feet high. Yeah. And when the Canadians were holding at Buron, they found that uh, these young SS enthusiasts were, were crawling up to them uh, on their bellies through the wheat. And so they brought up flail tanks. And they flailed the wheat with the tanks to get the SS infiltrators out of it. And I haven't seen an account of how that actually went, but I can't imagine laying on your belly in, in the wheat, having a flail tank coming down on you and waiting to see what happens. So I just put up throughout the aerial photo again. So just to remind you again, folks, that's where Mag and Coyne are parked. And they've been walking up this track there, say, as, as Mark said, they're towards a German gun position towards the Abbey Dard then. And you can see um, evidence of the fighting here. The, the, I, I don't know when that photo was taken, but there's craters and scuffing on the ground. There's potentially, I, do you think these are, are these are armored vehicle tracks, Mark? Yes, absolutely. And that I would think is a fairly early picture. Um, uh, at my book, I published one uh, photograph from actually from the day. And uh, what's really cool about those early photographs is you can actually see the track of individual vehicles. You can see where they've turned 180 and then gone uh, on or turned a different direction. So I would think given what transpires over the next month, that's a pretty early photograph. Yeah, I would Mike concur. Bechtel. Don't... Mike Bechtold would know. Contact him. Seriously. Yeah, he would know. He's the, he's the geek in regards to maps and aerial photos. And so th th we were talking when we, before we went live, Mark. You don't think this map is entirely correct in terms of the positions of some of the unit, units, but it does give a, a broad idea of this kind of north-south uh, nature of this battle there. So the, well, the, the, the green the and purple are Germans. The red is the Canadian. Yeah, it does. But if you look at the caption, it says, Le contre-attaque de 12e, or whatever it yeah. is, right? Um, just scroll back up. The first attack that hits the Canadians comes out of the Mule River Valley. If you read the testimony of the, of the Kurt Meyer trial that Chris Madsen published, and it's all in English, you don't have to be a German specialist, the, the Germans come out of the West to, to start the counterattack, and that comes 
first. Uh, and then once they're dealing with that attack, then the 12th SS moves across the ground, as you see here. So this is fairly typical in the sense that it only acknowledges the presence of one German formation in the area. And when Charles Stacy, the Canadian official historian, did his accounting of casualties after the battle, he said, well, it, you know, it, it, you know, Petsch got defeated by a force about his own size and uh, the casualties were about even, 300 Canadians, 300 Germans. But the 300 Germans was, were only the count from... Um, 12th SS. The Canadians spent most of the early part of the day fighting 21st Panzer and 716th Division with untold numbers of casualties. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think the Germans got hammered pretty heavily uh, in the early part, and then the Canadians gave as good as they got against a pretty tough bunch of young SS soldiers. Well, I think that's it, really. I mean, that, Matt Mag, I think they're, uh, uh, yeah, they're heading off. They're, well, they're, well they're, we'll just let them dr drive off, and that, that we'll show them that uh, that this traffic circle and the, the Carbacca is beyond there, but they're they're going to get back in time for curfew now, so they're going to head off. I think. Okay. We're, we're, Mark and I will kind of finish our conclusions, but thank you very much, Mag. Thank you, Colin, for driving. Thank you. Professional as usual. That's Mag's thumb up. Well done. So um, they're, oh, well, they're going to McDonald's for coffee. That's where they're going. They might be going to McDonald's for coffee. Yeah. So um, I will put it back on our screens, Mark, and we'll okay. we'll, sum we'll summarize this. So. Um, we, we we talk so often about this idea that we, we of this German narrative, the German story, and and the German version of this. And thanks very much, Mag. I'm going to drop you out now. Brilliant work. Thank you. See you later. I'll get the I'll get the dinner on in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, even the tour guides here in Normandy, and I include myself in this. We we use this often with regards to the the murder of the Canadian POW. They use the horrible incidents that happened in the Abbey, and I will cover those folks in a future show at some point will address that awful tragedy of the Canadian POW experience to the SS. But clearly your, your feeling Mark is that this story of it being an engagement of armor has been kind of pushed aside by this human tragedy of the POW. And, and you've tried to redress this and talk about this as an armored engagement. It, it's an armored encounter battle. Yeah. Um, when I, when I first put it to some American colleagues who were, serving officers, they said, wow, this is kind of what we would like to study because it's an armored encounter battle. Um, it's a little one-sided because all the uh, all the odds are on the German side. They have not only do they know the ground and they've got the drop on the Canadians, they've got all the anti-tank guns too. But it's um, it's a fascinating story. And the problem has traditionally been that it's been, it was sold in the Canadian official history as a failure, as a failure, not only to get to Carpacay, but as a failure to defeat a force, as Charles Stacey says, roughly their own size yeah um, and you know it, it, patch doesn't begin to panic in any meaningful way if they want to use the word panic the, until about three o'clock in the afternoon when he realizes what he's finally up against and the north novas man they they, they fight this out they yeah. fight it out with the 21st panzer and they fight it out with 12th ss and uh, there's a marvelous story of Radley Walters, who's ended up, this tank's gotten shot out from under him, and he's in somebody else's tank, and his squadron CO's driving the tank, and he's the gunner, and they're leaning out the tank as they come out of Buron, and they're headed south, or headed north, because they don't have any ammunition left. And he drives by a, a trench where there's a North Nova Scotia sergeant, and he's just pulling his fighting knife out of the belly or back of a, of a German soldier, and and Walters looks down and the guy smiles at him and gives him a big thumbs up. Um, these, are, these are tough buggers on both sides. And the Canadians gave as good as they got uh, against what were really quite astonishing odds. Uh, and then, you know, to pull back and hold at at uh, uh, Hell's Corner uh, when nobody's up on your left, it's the only sensible thing to do. And they hold yeah. there. And when the Germans finally counterattack across that open ground to try to take uh, villain Le Buisson and Le Buisson back from the Canadians, they just get hammered because, you know, to move in Normandy is to put yourself at risk. And it As we always say, attacking is difficult. Attacking yeah. is difficult. Um, and, you know, my great uncle was in Combon Plain and he taught, he was stuck there for a month. And he, he in C Company, 2nd Battalion, well, so was the same day, June the 7th, so 77 years ago today, he was the only officer in his company to not be wounded or killed. And it's because he was carrying a number four rifle, not a stand gun or a pistol, on the advice of his sergeant. And he just believes he wasn't targeted because it was elements of 21st Panzer in Combon Plain, part of the Campen group we talked about earlier. And, you know, and he 
dug into a fox spot, a fox on there. He sat for the next month, uh, essentially before he headed off into car. And so there's there's lots of interconnecting threads here. And I think we need to look at that historiography aspect of the fact the Canadians told the Canadian point of view, the British told the British point of view. And we said it on our show yesterday, talking about um, uh, the South Lanx on Sword Beach. There really isn't a good single volume that covers all of the British and Canadian sword Juno to Con book. I mean, your book does cover the stopping, you know, the stopping the panzers. There's lots of good books here and there, but a really good solid one that gathers all these sources together from all these sides is, is definitely something we all think we could do with. Yes, um, I agree. With all the information we now have, and 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 we need to address this idea, this this Kurt Meyer narrative, this whole. Uh, German focus of this story here, because and folks, if you're if you're if you're new to World War Two TV, you can scroll back through. And if you look in the, the YouTube description, I put the link to the show I did last year tomorrow uh, with Mike Bechtold about the next day of action, which took place in norion Bessan and Bredville Lorgiers. Uh, my camera work was a bit clunkier then because we were still using Zoom. It was in the infancy of World War Two TV, but you'll see about what happened the next day because the 12th S continued to butt heads with the Canadians, and then. Join us again in a few days' time when Mike Bechtel talks to us on the 11th about Le Manil Patry, another butting heads of the Canadians and 12 SS uh, in this area here. So the, 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 the themes of your book, Mark, I'll let you kind of fin finish off. What, what do you think still needs to be uh, learned from this engagement? The, the people who haven't read your book, sum up what people are misunderstanding about these few days with regards to the Canadians and the SS. Uh, two things, I would say. Uh, one is that uh, that lingering idea that somehow 12th SS prevented the Canadians from getting forward on D plus one, that we were somehow, I don't know, on a, on a magic carpet ride to Berlin. Uh, if you read the op order for 3rd Canadian Division, it's very clear what their job is. They need to get on the two fortress positions and kill the pens or counterattacks. There are three core level attempts to launch pens or counterattacks uh, on the 7th, 8th, and 9th actually 10th of June, and the Canadians see them off, all of them. Yeah. Uh, there's a marvelous guy named Gordon Henry who commands a, a troop of, of uh, the Fort Gary, not, sorry, not Fort Gary, First Desires, um, and, and his tank kills five Panthers with six shots in about four minutes on the 10th of June, or morning of the 9th of June. They actually shoot up most of the uh, newly arrived Panthers of 12th SS, and um, nobody takes a look at that. So yeah. the Canadian job is not to do what Montgomery suggested, which is to get ashore and crack about with tanks. They knew perfectly well that their job was to get ashore and kill the pens or counterattack. And they did. In fact, it, it never really got very far. It, 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 it seldom got beyond the, the forward Canadian platoons before it was shot to pieces. Uh, so there's that. Um, the Canadian role is not what people have said it was. The second is... Uh, the Canadians and the Brits, on the whole, fight a whole lot better than the first generation of post-war historians were prepared yep. to give them credit. Yep. Um, Absolutely. My father I mean, we talked about say, it so often, yeah. yeah. My father used to say the Canadian army was a basket case, but we beat those bastards. So how bad could the German army have been? And I can't yeah. answer that. But, yeah. but, uh, but uh, the guy who was in command of my father's field regiment, a tough, irascible guy. I interviewed him when he was 92, and I said, what did you think? And he kind of curled up his nose and he said that Germans did stupid things and we killed those bastards in large numbers. And that's not in the, any other book but mine, but it should be. Um, my father uh, admired what he saw of the Wehrmacht, thought they were well disciplined. Like most Canadians, didn't think too much of the 12th SS. Just really had problems with those kids and the punks that led them. Well, well, indeed. And and the other thing, you know, there's two ways of looking at the 12th SS. They are murdering our souls who do some horrible stuff to our guys and, and your guys here. But also, as a as Mike Bechtold is always banging on about on Twitter, and he's absolutely right, they were not a particularly effective combat unit. They they do all right when things are going well for them. But the minute, the second it starts turning against them, they crumble really, really quickly. Well, and, well, when the artillery starts to fire... What's left of the vanguard chases these kids across the battlefield all the way back to Aughty. Yeah. They recapture Buron with very few people because they, they, they're just, they're kids. They're kids. And I've, any of us who have done this for any length of years have talked to veterans who, who were still haunted by the fact that they thought they had to shoot children. 
Yeah. Didn't mind shooting the NCOs and the officers because they were older guys and they were bastards. But when the kids wouldn't give up, when the 17 year olds just insisted on dying uh, and they had to shoot them, uh, that, that never apparently got easy. My, my great uncle, one of his stories in the Royal Ulsters, and I forget this was over towards Troan, I think later on. And it was a, it was an SS guy who, who had was left behind in like the tower or the rampart of a manor house. It wasn't a church. It was some kind of overlooking tower. And when they finally, he, he was responsible for some three or four Royal Ulster rifles guys being killed and when they find that his C company honed in on this on this manor house, the end, the bottom of the staircase had been grenaded, but it looked like it had been grenaded from from not the tower, from inside, like the SS, and actually deliberately prevented this guy from ac- from getting out and said, "You will go up there and die for the cause." Yeah. And they had, and he, and when they finally winked him out there, they they had put a pier shot or something through the tower and killed him that way. But when they cleared all the rubble and went up and found this German kid in the tower. And I'm not making this up. He had his little teddy bear kind of souvenir sitting with him on the ledge there, and they all just burst into tears. That this 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 fanatic also had a little soft toy souvenir he'd brought with him. And when they saw that there, and you can just you can't you can't even con- put into your head the idea of a kid shooting at Allied soldiers with a teddy bear on the rampart. Because I'm just just horrific. Yeah, there's his little mascot. Just awful. Well, I think we've 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 gone full circle. Uh, people have absolutely appreciated what you're doing. Really good viewing numbers for 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 considering it's a it's a Monday evening after D Day. People have got the D Day hangover, and yeah. I, it's a cracking start off for what we're doing in this attrition week. And I do I uh, urge people to go ahead. Just if you haven't got it already, just go and get Mark's book because it is a stunning book there, um, and also his book on the uh, Battle of the Atlantic, which is also he's. he's Excellent at two spheres, the armored warfare in Normandy aspect and the Battle of Atlantic. Highly regarded. Paul Errington and others, Paul Reed watching this. We've enjoyed listening to you and 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 telling it, I think, from this other point of view, telling it from the Canadian point of view, as opposed to this this Kurt Meyer SS narrative. And in fact, as you explained, the SS don't come into the story till comparatively later. It's the 21st Panzer that were the early force there. So absolutely brilliant. Have you enjoyed doing it, Mark? Yes, it's been good fun. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank thank you. you. So I'll just remind people we've got coming up, and I'll say goodbye to you again in a second. So, folks, tomorrow night, Niels Henkemans is joining us live from the Netherlands, and we're having Mag out on the ground again at Dead Man's Corner up between saint Combe de mont and Carenton to talk about their 101st and the 70th Tampa Town and all that. That'll be quite cool. And then uh, 9th of June, John Ontar is coming back to talk about Eisenhower, so not a battlefield show. 10th of June, James Fenelon, uh, Crossing of the Rhine. Then 11th of June, Mike Bechtold, uh, Manil Patry. So lots and lots coming up. And then there's more beyond that that I won't bore you with. Don't forget to check us out on Patreon. Follow us on Twitter. Tell people what we're doing, and and we'll get more of a, of a, of a, of a viewership. So... It remains me now to say thank you very much, uh, Mark Milner, for joining us. Your knowledge is astounding. You've given us an incredible presentation. Thank you very much for doing it. Um, and for everybody else, World War II TV, this is Paul Woodard. I will see you all again next time, tomorrow evening, same time, Dead Man's Corner. <laughs>